Hi, welcome to this episode of Patient Education for the Educated Patient. Today we're going to go line by line through a informed consent form for a trial of labor after C-section. So the consent is a informed consent process where you discuss the risks of a procedure, the benefits of the procedure, and the alternatives to that procedure. And again, for trial of labor after cesarean section, ACOG has the stance that we should have a shared decision-making or joint decision-making process, but ultimately patients get the say, but they can do it in consultation with their obstetrician or their doctor or their provider. So the informed consent that we're using, there's multiple versions. This template originally was published in 1996 in OBG Management. This was written by Jeffrey Phelan, who has both a MD and a JD. So he's a physician and a lawyer. So if this consent reads like it was written by a lawyer, well, it was. And like I said, since 1996, there have been multiple iterations of this vaginal birth after C-section consent form. This is three I found on the internet, and they're all just slightly different. So we're going to go over the one that we use in our office, starting with line one. I understand that I have had one or more prior cesarean sections. And so remember, ACOG says that if you've had a previous C-section in the lower urine segment or the non-contracting part of the uterus, you are a candidate for a trial of labor after C-section, whether it's one C-section, two C-sections, a low vertical C-section, or even an unknown scar that you're fairly certain is in the lower part of the uterus, in the non-contracting part of the uterus, you are also a candidate for a trial of labor after C-section. Now your risk of rupture is going to vary, but ultimately it's low enough that it justifies trying a trial of labor after C-section in the right setting with all safety precautions taken. So line two, I understand that I have the option of undergoing an elective repeat cesarean section or attempting a vaginal birth after a C-section. And so this is what we talked about earlier that ACOG has the stance that patients get to choose between a scheduled repeat C-section or a vaginal birth after C-section via a trial of labor after C-section. Line three, I understand approximately 70% of women who undergo a VBAC will successfully deliver vaginally. And that's important. Just because you choose a trial of labor, it doesn't mean everybody's going to deliver vaginally 100% of the time. It's not zero, it's not 100%, but it's realistically about 70%. Now there's different risk factors that can adjust it up or down, and we did have a whole video about a VBAC calculator that was created by the Maternal Fetal Medicine Unit Network. So that can help you decide based on your success rates and risks of repeat C-section whether or not those benefits of delivering vaginally justify the risks of winding up with another C-section. Line number four, I understand the risk of a uterine rupture during a VBAC in someone such as myself who has had a prior incision in the non-contracting part of my uterus is around 1%. And so again, the risk of uterine rupture is going to vary somewhat up or down based on your individual history. For example, if you've had one C-section, it's a documented low transverse C-section, it was more than 18 months ago, then your risk of uterine rupture is probably between 0.5 and 1%. If you've had two low transverse C-sections, then your risk of rupture is probably 1 to 1.5%. Unknown scars in the lower uterine segment or suspected in the lower uterine segment have a rupture rate of about 1 to 1.5%. And low vertical incisions on the uterus also have a low uterine rupture rate. Line 5, I understand that VBAC is associated with a higher risk of harm 
to my baby than to me. And that's true in very broad strokes or in generalized terms. In the previous episode, we discussed the different risks to the mom and the risks to the baby based on scheduled C-sections and trial of labors. So if you haven't watched that video, go back and review it. It's on the introduction to TOLAX or VBAX. But if you recall, the risk of fetal death is higher in the trial of labor after C-section group than it is in the scheduled C-section group. The risk of intrapartum fetal death is more than 10 times higher in the trial of labor group. And the risk of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, which is brain damage from lack of oxygen, is also higher in the TOLAC group. The risk of neonatal mortality and perinatal mortality were both higher in the trial of labor after C-section group as well. But you have to remember the overall number is still very, very, very low. So you're still comparing a large relative risk, but the absolute risk is still very low in both categories. So line six, I understand that if my uterus ruptures during my VBAC, there may not be sufficient time to operate and to prevent the death of or permanent brain injury to my baby. And this is a precaution to patients because you may have done everything right. You may have continuous fetal monitoring. You may be in a hospital with 24-7 anesthesia, 24-7 in-house laborists to back up your OBGYN. And you see something abnormal happen to the fetal heart rate tracing. You run back to the operating room. You get delivered by emergency C-section. But you may do it all within 20 minutes, but it may not be fast enough to prevent the fetal death or the brain damage. And like I said in the previous slide and in the previous episode, that the risks to the baby are higher with TOLAC, including intrapartum fetal death, perinatal mortality, neonatal mortality, and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So line seven, I understand the decision to have a VBAC is entirely my own, and the option of an elective repeat cesarean has been discussed with me. And like I said, ACOG's stance is that patients get to choose between a scheduled repeat C-section and a TOLAC, and that decision should be made in consultation with their obstetrician with shared or joint decision making. Line eight is the opposite of line five. I understand that VBAC carries a lower risk to me than does a cesarean delivery. And again, this was addressed in the prior episode where we talked about an introduction to the TOLAC and VBAC. And so we addressed both the risks to baby and risks to mom. So if you can recall, the risks to mom in terms of maternal death were higher in the scheduled C-section arm. And in that group, they had more than a five times higher chance of maternal death than in the group where they underwent a trial of labor after C-section. But similar, let's keep in mind to the fetal risks. These may be high relative risks, but the absolute risk is still very low. Line nine, I understand that if I deliver vaginally, I most likely will have fewer problems after delivery and a shorter hospital stay than if I have a cesarean delivery. And that's true. That's kind of why we're having this whole conversation. If we knew you were going to deliver vaginally with no complications, it would be a very easy decision. But the problem is, on average, only 70% of patients are going to deliver vaginally who try. But if you do deliver vaginally, for the most part, you're going to have a better outcome for the baby and a better outcome for the mom than if you had tried a scheduled C-section. Now, the problem is, is if it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, you wind up with a C-section after labor, in the first stage or in the second stage, and those are at much higher risk C-sections, and we address that in a separate line. Line 10, I understand that during my VBAC, the use of oxytocin or pitocin hormone to make my uterus contract may be necessary to assist me in my vaginal delivery. 
And the risks of this drug have been thoroughly explained to me. So that's important to understand because Pitocin medicine via the IV may be needed to help you deliver vaginally. But the problem is the risk of using Pitocin is a higher chance of uterine rupture. So you may have a better shot at delivering vaginally or having a VBAC with Pitocin, but the risk is a higher chance of uterine rupture. Now, nobody really knows what the risk of uterine rupture with and without Pitocin is, but it's been estimated as high as doubling your risk of uterine rupture if you use Pitocin. So that may be 0.7% to now 1.4%. So again, the relative risk may be astonishing or high, but the absolute risk still remains low. Low enough that the use of Pitocin in a trial of labor after C-section is not contraindicated. But you should be aware that if you do need Pitocin and you don't want to take on the higher risk of uterine rupture, you can definitely throw in the towel and just undergo a C-section at that point. But again, Pitocin is not contraindicated in a trial of labor after C-section, but you should be aware of the risk of uterine rupture if you do choose to use Pitocin to increase your chance of vaginal birth after C-section. Line 11, I understand that if I choose a VBAC and end up having a cesarean during labor, I have a greater risk of problems than if I had had an elective repeat cesarean. And this is what we talked about back on line nine is that if you try a trial of labor after C-section and it works, that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is you try and you wind up with a C-section because at that point you wish you would have already scheduled a C-section because a scheduled C-section has less risks then a C-section performed, having had a previous C-section, now you're in labor, you may be in the first or the second stage of labor. And if you recall from the very early PEEP episodes, four, five, and six, we talked about how a second stage C-section is very, very, very high risk compared to a stage one C-section. Now, if you're doing a second stage C-section and you've had a history of a C-section, well, that's just going to be even more high risk. So the purpose of line 11 is that trying a trial of labor after C-section and succeeding is the best outcome, but if it doesn't work out, it can quickly become the worst outcome. You would have wished you had just scheduled a C-section to begin with. But unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball in hindsight's 2020. So line 12, I have read or have had read to me the above information and I understand it. So again, this is just one version of multiple versions of an informed consent. And these all started from 1996. And your VBAC or TOLAC consent may look nothing like this, but this is just one example that has several different bullet points that are all little nuggets of information that help you make a decision whether or not to schedule a C-section or try a trial of labor after C-sections in hopes of achieving a VBAC. So hopefully that helps. This is the end. And as we said in those 11 bullet points that we have successfully addressed the risks, the benefits, and the alternatives to a trial of labor after C-section. Now, the reason we go into so much detail when it comes to informed consent is, like I said, there are cases in the law and in courts where doctors have been sued and lost a substantial amount of money. Here, the jury awarded the plaintiffs $14.9 million. And this was a case done in California. Here, a 39-year-old patient with a previous C-section for twins opted for a TOLAC. She had an induction of labor, fetal macrosomia, ultimately got to the second stage of labor. And see here, she's in the second stage of labor. But when labor failed to progress over the next 25 minutes, they called the doctor. The doctor came in 20 minutes later proceeded with a C-section that was delivered 20 minutes after that. 
But the problem is the baby ended up with severe brain damage and cerebral palsy. And ultimately, they were awarded $15 million for that outcome. And even though the delivery happened within 20 minutes of the doctor deciding to do the delivery. And so again, like I said, hindsight is 2020. There was a lot of risk factors. If we just pick apart this little bit of information here, as we talked about before, 39 years old is not young. So the younger you are, the higher your chance of delivering vaginally, having had a C-section. And that goes back to two videos ago when we talked about the vaginal birth after C-section. We did briefly talk about induction of labor is very tricky when you've had a history of a C-section and induction of labor outright, no matter how you do it, is going to increase your risk of uterine rupture. Here they're doing an induction for fetal macrosomia, which is also a higher risk for uterine rupture. If you have a really big baby, not only is that going to increase your risk for uterine rupture, but it's also going to increase your risk of C-section for things like arrest of descent, arrest of dilation. So this whole case seems like a setup for failure only in hindsight. This scenario probably would have resulted in a vaginal delivery, you know, 50% of the time or had a C-section done with no problems, you know, 49% of the time, but it was that one in a hundred where the baby wound up with severe brain damage and cerebral palsy. And that's unacceptable to a jury, to patients, to babies, to families, and for most physicians. So as bad as this outcome was, you can see why doctors are so careful when it comes to the informed consent process because ultimately ACOG stands by their decision that patients need to make this decision, but they need to know what they're getting themselves into. And so that's why the informed consent sounds so legal and kind of like a legal contract because it is. And it was originally drafted by a lawyer who was also a physician. And that's kind of why it sounds the way it does. It's not meant to scare you one direction or another, but it's definitely designed to make you aware of all the risks and the benefits and the alternatives. So hopefully that helps. And like I said, there's no absolute, yes, you should have a scheduled C-section or no, you should try a trial of labor after C-section. You definitely need to take all the information in. The more information you have at your fingertips, the better so that you can make a healthy and educated and good decision for you, your baby, your pregnancy, your future pregnancies, your family, etc. No two patients are alike, so you got to make sure you individualize the care of the patient to that individual, to that specific patient. So hopefully that helps go back and look at the vaginal birth after C-section calculator episode. You can review the vaginal birth after C-section and TOLAC introduction video. And again, you can watch this video again if that shed any light on the vaginal birth after C-section or TOLAC consent process. Hopefully that helps. Until the next episode, stay healthy and stay educated. Thank you for watching this episode of Patient Education for the Educated Patient. I hope you found this content both helpful and meaningful, and that you'll be able to use it to live a healthier life. If there's any questions, please leave them in the comments section below. I do welcome feedback, so please also leave me any comments or suggestions in the comments section. Please subscribe and turn on the notifications, and I hope to see you at the next episode. Until then, Stay healthy and stay educated.